So I don't think the gentleman to my left needs no. too much of an introduction. Uh, Tim Draper. Oh, but go on anyway, go on. just for yeah, fun. You'll enjoy yeah. it. Uh, in the annals of Silicon Valley history, I think Tim Draper will go down as one of the most memorable, larger-than-life characters, uh, a founder of Draper Associates and DFJ. Uh, his investments include everything from Baidu to Hotmail to Skype to Tesla, a laundry list of uh, mega brands. So let's just get right into it. Um, you've had this long career in venture capital, not to make you sound too old or anything. What are you still trying to do better at this point? Well, so um, I guess in looking back, I see what some of these entrepreneurs has been able to do and uh, have been able to do. And they have been able to take industries where the consumer was no longer satisfied and transform it into an industry where consumers were satisfied again. So just to give you an example, um, the post office. Nobody was satisfied with the post office. And you had to write these letters on paper, kill trees, whatever, and then lick poison and put it into uh, you know, a car that would go into an airplane that would go into another car to eventually get this thing to this message to someone. And, uh, and then free web-based email came along and it transformed that industry. Same thing with the electric car coming in and making it so that we weren't in these gas guzzler cars. Um, and Tesla really changed, uh, changed that whole industry. Um, when there is an oligopoly, when there is a monopoly where, and, and you define that as an industry where a few players control it and the customer is paying too much and getting too little. Whenever that is the case, there is a big opportunity uh, for an entrepreneur to come in and change all that. So that's, I think, what is driving me moving forward. Um, so going, looking back, that's what I'm seeing. And going forward, I'm saying, wow, well, then what industries do we need to change now? So looking back a little <laughs> bit, you're one of the rare folks in Silicon Valley who can say you're a third generation VC. Yeah. What did you learn from? My, my sons and my daughter are now fourth generation. So, so, so what, did you, what did you learn from your dad, from your grandfather, that still carries through <laughs> to your work today? Um, well, a couple of things. They gave me some good advice along the way many, many times. And, and, but I think the one thing that has passed from my grandfather to my father, and then my father to me, and then me to my children, um, and I have a grandchild now, so we'll have to tell her, but I don't think she's ready to hear it. She's only three months old, um, uh, is this. It doesn't matter if you're selling or buying. Um, it's that human connection that matters. It's not, um, it's not uh, if you're selling, sometimes people are a little embarrassed to sell. Think of it as just making that human connection. And it has made selling for me much easier. And it has made me much, a much more understanding buyer. And I think that has really helped me. And then the other thing is, when you make a deal with someone uh, or a group of people, make sure everyone uh, feels that that deal is a good deal and will last for a long, long time. And so having a long-term view of, uh, of a deal, I think, is another thing that they passed on. And that, that does work very well. So one of the things we were talking about a few minutes ago was the constancy of change, right, in our world. And you have to be ready to figure out not just how to adapt to change, but how to drive it. So as someone who's been in the VC world for such a long time, when you look at your industry, what is the industry doing well? And where is it failing? Where does it need to change to adapt for what's going on right now? Well, you know, I think my industry is one of these oligopolies that looks like it's ready for the picking for entrepreneurs. Um, we're, it, we're sort of a clubby industry. Uh, we have a f almost fixed pricing with our uh, investors. And, uh, and entrepreneurs will negotiate deals out. And so that's a little bit more of a fair deal because the entrepreneur has more options. But um, the way we've sort of fixed the way we work with investors is, um, is sort of oligopoly thinking. 
And I think there are all sorts of huge opportunities now with new technologies to, uh, to take on my industry uh, as well as the investment banking and the banking world. In fact, when I, when I looked at Bitcoin, I thought, wow, that is really interesting. That, the way the internet challenged uh, communications, information, and media, Bitcoin can actually challenge commerce, finance, investment banking, banking, uh, and venture capital. And so, um, so I think this is a transformative time, a transformative, that's a transformative technology. And all of these interesting fintech companies are coming along. I'll give you a few examples. We have a couple of companies that are going after what I, I'm calling uh, networked accounting. Right now, if I send you, if I sell you this bottle of water, which I'm not selling, by the way, um, but if I sell you this bottle of water um, and you pay me a dollar for it, we both have to update our own accounting. But with networked accounting, it just goes shooting into the cloud. We made this transaction, and then, um, and then all the sales and accounts receivable and cash and payables, all of those things that needed to be changed are now changed. And then we get our portion of that. And it can happen through a, a three-way deal or a hundred-way deal. Uh, and that can really transform and, but right? <clears throat> what do you worry about with that kind of transformation? Actually, with that transformation, I, I mean, if I were an accountant, I would try to figure out how I would operate in a, in a field where the computer can actually do a better job, faster, whatever. Um, uh, there are a couple of other things that are changing in financial technology. Um, one is e -share, electronic shares. A company like eShares or CapShares can, uh, can hold your shares up in the cloud and then if a transfer needs to happen, it can just be done like this. Right now, if I need to transfer private or public shares to you, and you need the physical shares, or you need the real, the right to have them, um, that's like a, that can be a three month process with lawyers, accountants, it can be just a nightmare, and now this can be done like that. So uh, I believe financial technologies are ripe for the picking. I think. Uh, there are a couple other places to go after. If all, all of you look like good potential entrepreneurs out there, I would also go after education because that's sort of a K-12 education is very much a monopoly operation. That can, that's an easy target. Uh, go after medicine. Having Anytime they say big anything, like big pharma or the big four auto companies, whenever it's big, you know that that's an oligopoly and that's something you can go after. And now we also have big government. Um, I think there's an opportunity for entrepreneurship in government too. So we'll get to some of that uh, a little bit later. I, I do want to switch gears and talk about another form of change that a lot of people are agitating for. So a few years ago, you did a memorable, memorable video in which you took off a piece of clothing for each company led by a woman that you had invested in. Yeah, that would, uh, I'd be naked today if that were the case. <laughs> but, but we did it, I, I won the award as the person who had funded the most women uh, as a venture capitalist, uh, this Ostia group, and they somehow convinced me to do a partial strip tease. So Today you wouldn't want to see it, but back then. <laughs> so, so what needs to change as far as the position of women in Silicon Valley? Okay, so the great thing about Silicon Valley is that it is a meritocracy, a word you used, um, that, uh, that I believe if you are an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter who you are, and you can be anything you want. And when, when women talk about breaking through this glass ceiling or this glass, um, they, if they start the business, if you're an entrepreneur and you start the business, you can paint the ceiling any color you want. You own the ceiling. And, uh, and I think, so I believe that entrepreneurship from women is going to be a huge, it, there, it's just gonna be an enormous wave. And, uh, and we are encouraging, we have more, for instance, more, more uh, 
at Draper University of Heroes, of which some of you are. So go ahead. Let's hear it. Thank you. Um, uh, we have more uh, scholarships for women than we do anything else. Because we're looking and we're saying, look, those women who start companies, they are unique. They are specially driven. They, uh, they have something really going for them. And we want to be kind of there when they make it all happen. Um, and so we are really encouraging that. And, and, uh, and right now at Draper University of Heroes, it's something like uh, the applications we get, it's something like 15 or 20 percent women. And so I've gone out to Smith College, which is all women, and I've given Smith a, uh, a Draper business plan competition so that, uh, so that they would, and, and then the winner gets to go to Draper University and gets $10,000. And, and they've built this, uh, they've started to build this whole infrastructure around women, and Smith is almost rebranding now. They were um, getting to be the, the uh, bisexual and lesbian center of, uh, of women's colleges. And now it, they can take that and they can move it toward entrepreneurship. So it's actually um, quite, quite a good fit. So are you saying that the answer for women in Silicon Valley is they have to start their own thing? Um, I, think, I think women are, um, in Silicon Valley generally, are, um, are going to be valued for who, what they can accomplish, what they can do, uh, because Really, when you're starting a business, it's just like, hey, who's performing, who's not? Let's make this thing happen. If it's not working out, go find another startup or do something else. And if it's working out, yeah, here, we're going to give you more stock. We're going to bump up your salary. Hey, we really need you. This is really important. And so I think it all has to do with uh, performance. It's a very free market out here. Uh, I think if women start a business or are a part of a startup team, then they don't, they don't have to worry about breaking through some glass ceiling. You know, that glass ceiling has always bothered me. If you start a business and you build the business and it's your business and it's been fantastic, and somebody says, well, yeah, but you're a guy and you're running your business, and why don't you have a woman running this business? Well, I mean, look, are you going to quit so that that happens? No, but if you're a woman starting the business, same thing. So I would encourage women to go start those businesses and be the CEO. They turns out women are incredibly good CEOs. They encourage the people around them. They're very tight with money, in general. In general, um, and they have uh, and, and they have great ways of encouraging great behavior uh, from people around them. So we have had we've had some good success with women, and and uh, one woman, if you if you. We, we've, we've sort of had average returns until this one woman. Uh, my daughter's good friend, uh, Elizabeth Holmes, started this business. She came to me. She said, I'm dropping out of Stanford. And I, I knew her parents very well. And I said, but your parents know this? And they said, yeah. She said, yeah, they're OK with it. And I'm dropping out of Stanford to start this business that is going to transform healthcare." And she had such energy and such drive. I thought, OK, well, you know, I, as long as your parents are OK with it, because I didn't want to upset them, I will give you your first money to get this thing going. And, uh, and I gave her the first money. And she started to build her business. And here we are about 10 years later. And, uh, and it's called Theranos. And it's worth $9 billion. And it was, uh, the idea is, uh, right, I mean, right now, if you go to the doctor and you have to get like five te five blood tests, they they put the needle in your arm and they pull five pints of blood out or whatever it is, a lot of blood out. And uh, with Elizabeth's program, Theranos, you go to Walgreens, you prick your finger, put two drops of blood into a microfluidic chamber, and you get 50 tests. And even better than that, you get 50 tests that will be measured and saved so that the next time you run those tests, you're going to see what your trend is and how your vitamin D levels are, or how your, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a doctor. 
a lot of different tests. Anyway, they can run 50 tests on two drops of blood, uh, and it is really changing medicine. And that was a woman entrepreneur, great technologist. She really made great things happen. So I'm, I'm looking for more of you. And I see women in the audience. Come on, baby. <laughs> the takeaway, women can be awesome CEOs too. Uh, let's talk about Draper University of Heroes. What does it mean to be a superhero? What are you trying to teach people? So, you know, it, after 2008 when the market crashed and everybody was panicking and they were all thinking, oh, the dollar's gonna be worthless and wait, what are we, you know, we're gonna go back to the farms and things are really awful. And um, I thought, gosh, there are no heroes. Where are the heroes? Heroes should be rising up right now and making great things happen. And eventually they did come along, but, but uh, I thought, you know, now may be the time where I need to uh, go out and, and think in terms of training heroes. Now, heroes can be any, in any walk of life. They can be uh, revolutionaries. They can be entrepreneurs. They can be artists. They can be uh, any number of different, uh, they can take their careers in any number of different directions. But, uh, but what a hero does have is this, uh, this confidence, this determination, uh, this, uh, this ability to attract other people to their mission. And, uh, and that's something that people have always told me, well, entrepreneurship can't be taught. It's all inbred or whatever. It's all in, innate, not inbred, <laughs> innate. Um, and, uh, and whenever anybody says you can't, I always think, well, how would you? And that was something that kind of has always, that's something that's always been in me, is like when people say you can't do this, I'd always think, well, how can I kind of work around their can't thing? And, uh, and a good entrepreneur does think that way. Anyway, I thought, how would you? And then I thought, okay, well, let's create Draper University of Heroes. And, um, and the difference, the reason we, we have superheroes as our theme is heroes is often a term used in history, but superheroes is a term for the future. Superheroes are people's imaginations. They, they're saying things could happen in the future. It's, it's more of a futuristic term. And at Draper University of Heroes, we teach future rather than history, so it's science fiction, predictive analytics, um, forecasting, a lot of that, uh, and a lot less of he did this or you know, hearsay about some great entrepreneur who did something a long time ago. Um, then the other things we do at Draper University, um, I don't want to give away too much because the students are here, but there's a whole piece uh, that's focused on business, but we, instead of teaching just marketing, we teach viral marketing, social media, crowdsourcing, a whole variety of things. Um, we have survival training. Uh, so stay in shape, you Draper University of Heroes people. Um, we have real survival training, in both urban and rural. And, uh, and then we have, uh, they, they eventually build their business or start their business and have a uh, two minute presentation to a panel of venture capitalists. So it's a, it's a different kind of a place. Everything's team based. Uh, there's no A. The A means good job, you didn't make any mistakes. And we are encouraging outrageous behavior and mistakes. So your superheroes are pretty diverse. You know, there are folks who want to do food trucks. There are folks who are in jewelry. Um, there's one guy who's an alum who wants to make the SAT super fun. Good luck with that. Um, when you're looking at that kind of business and not for By the way, be careful about that because name any nonprofit that's had a bigger impact on society than Google or than Hotmail or than Skype. Uh, those, are, those are companies that have... Uh, lower geographic borders, have spread information around the world, have shown people how to fish rather than throwing them fish. Uh, there are some, I mean, there are some great nonprofits out there, 
Kiva, for one. Kiva couldn't be operated as a for-profit or they would have been regulated as a bank, so they ended up going as a non-profit. So when you're looking at these <laughs> kind of social impact businesses, the explicit yeah. ones as opposed to the Googles of the world, uh, do you look at those kinds of investments differently? Um, actually, no, because actually I believe that see, these new technologies can really transform our world in great ways, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, and typically they are for-profit. Uh, you know, I mean, Uber, somebody mentioned Uber earlier, and Uber is, uh, has really transformed the way we get from here to there. Uh, all of these new technologies are really making a huge impact on our life, and generally that's driven by a, a really good entrepreneur, whether that entrepreneur is operating in a for-profit or non-profit environment. And those are the people I like to back, and I, those are the, the opportunities I like to pursue. When you can make an enormous impact on society in some way, um, and a lot of that often is to, uh, to create startups that challenge the status quo. So let's end with a question about challenging the status quo. Six Californias. Yeah. So let me take you through my thinking on Six Californias. Briefly. <laughs> we got time. So, <laughs> so um, I was, uh, I had amazing education. I had uh, my K-8 education was all here in California in public school. California was the number one public school in the nation. Uh, California had all the number one public schools in the nation. They were number one uh, best place to do business. They had the lowest poverty rates. Um, okay, so that was 45 years ago. Uh, today, California is 47th in K-12 education. We're 50th. We're the worst place to do business in the entire country. Um, we have uh, the, one of the highest poverty levels, in fact, I think we're third highest poverty level in uh, number of people below the poverty line in the entire country. We, um, we, we have the, one of the highest recidivism rates, which means the people who go to prison and then just keep coming back. We have four times as many prisoners as we did 45 years ago. Uh, and our infrastructure spending has gone from um, Twenty-eight percent of our budget to three percent of our budget. So, and it, it wasn't about the people. I've met the people who who run the state, who operate the state, the the bureaucracy, the uh, politicians, and the uh, and the leaders, the governors and senators and whatever. Met them. They're fantastic people. They're doing extraordinary things. They're trying the best they possibly can. I'm looking at it and I'm saying it's operating as a monopoly. It is operating where there is no competition. We're stuck with them. We're stuck with the system. They can charge whatever they want and provide this horrible service that they've been providing. Uh, with six Californias, uh, I believe we can create six new states, new platforms for growth, each of those states can have its own drive, its own ambition, and we'll, have clo we'll be closer to our uh, representatives. They're going to understand us better, and they will end up doing a better job. They've got to. I mean, after all, we've, we've got the worst job going now. Any change is going to be better than what we've got. You take any six states in the United States, and they are all better run than ours. And so by creating Six Californias, it got me thinking that we, that we need that entrepreneurial drive to create these new, uh, these new states, these new platforms for growth, and we need to challenge the status quo that has been failing us. And, and let me give you a, a few examples, because people say, oh, this can never be done, it's so complicated, whatever. Um, uh, Singapore. 45 years ago was one of the poorest countries in the world. It is now one of the richest. That was all about a platform for growth. Korea, same thing. After the Korean War, one of the poorest countries in the world, now one of the richest. Japan, 
after World War II, one of the poorest countries in the world, now one of the richest. Um, and it all had to do with a good platform for growth. Uh, it's already spawned a great new government. And that great new government is Estonia. Uh, there, the president of Estonia came, lived here for eight years, and has gone back to Estonia. And now in Estonia, they have digital ID, uh, uh, iris scan or whatever. They, um, uh, that you can have dig digital signatures are all legal. Uh, it is, uh, they, they can set up a bank account. Whereas in Europe, if you want to set up a bank account today, it'll s take six months if you go through Luxembourg or any of the other countries. And uh, they can t turn it around in 24 hours. You can be a virtual citizen, virtual resident of Estonia. They have done this all because they said, wow, all of this new technology is here. Why aren't we incorporating it in our government? Uh, so they have really done some extraordinary things. And they had the benefit of being a lot of the leaders of Skype were lived in Estonia. And they saw how an entrepreneurial venture could transform an entire world. And they're going to do the same thing there. And I feel like we could easily do that here in the Silicon Valley. Why watch it happen in Estonia when we've got all the technology here? Would you really be happy if your state capital was Oakland? Yeah, That's actually, I, I actually believe that the state capital could, um, could move. Uh, why not? You'd have much better representation. You'd be closer to your government. I, I think every five years or so, 10 years, whatever, you can move the state capital. Uh, and you would get real representation there. But who knows? I mean, it's really up to all of us to determine what our, what our new six governments would be. But, uh, but that's just an idea. Sure, I, I would be happy to have, I'd be happy to have a state capital in Oakland because it's a lot closer. And if we had an issue that people in Oakland would really understand it, and they wouldn't be living in the 1980s, which, you know, if you go to any government office, you guys all know, any government office, all the equipment, the people, they're all living in the 1980s. What skills do you think the risk master is going to have to deploy to make this venture work that are different from So the I want to be clear about the risk master. I wrote that song, The Risk Master. And it was really about all of you. It was really about the entrepreneur. It's the person who takes this extraordinary risk, a, a, a social risk, a career risk, a financial risk, to go out there and stand for something and have uh, and, and build a following and grow that opportunity, whatever that opportunity is, and then kind of see if they could make a big change in the world or even try to make a, you know, a dent that would eventually lead to a big change in the world. And so uh, Risk Master isn't, um, people say it's me. It's, I mean, I guess I'm partly Risk Master because I'm starting a school and starting a six new states. <laughs> so what's it going to take? What, it's a different venture than anything you've tried before. So well, it's not really different. Um, it, I didn't go through all my thinking. Um, I saw that, uh, that our education system had failed us. And, uh, and I saw that my kids were going through a very different education system than I was. Like, I was going through something that was first in the nation. They're going through something that was 47th in the nation. So I got very active in education, and I joined the state, I eventually got appointed to be a member of the State Board of Education, and I saw things like this. This is how distant the, the decision maker is from the, from the constituent. Um, people came to us at the state board level and they said, hey, um, we'd like to take our milk money and build a gym with it. And we, we said, oh, how could you possibly take the Milk from the mouths of babes. That's horrible. How could you even think to do that? Get out of our office and blow it. Turns out those people are from Petaluma. Any of you guys been to Petaluma? Okay, there are more cows than people in Petaluma. They are swimming in milk. They needed a gym. How were we, what, what was it up to us? Why was it up to us to make that decision for them? And 
And not only that, but now people in Sacramento, they all live there. It's not like they come back and live in their, their district. They all live there, and they make these decisions in sort of an isolated way, and we let them. We just let that happen. Oh, okay, yeah, oh, a bag law. Yeah, that's the right thing for all of us. You know, and so important that we pay 10 cents a bag and that we don't have big gulps. I mean, all of these things, so fundamentally important. So, you know, of course, let's, let's point to the big gulp law or the bag law and get everybody thinking about them when our education system goes from 48th to 49th to 50th to, you know, where everybody's a prisoner. I mean, I think this is just, it, it, we, we're letting this happen and we really don't have to. It's a monopoly and it needs a challenge. And I think Six Californias is that challenge. I'm gonna bring Tim back on stage a little bit later and you might even get to hear him sing, but for the moment, join me in thanking Tim Draper. <clears throat> Great.